how can you address what is happening to a child or an adult that has a genetic disorder if you don't know what is wrong. Uh, and I was fascinated by this idea of small change in DNA and then recognizing a pattern of changes in patients and helping them find the best way to address everything that they have, their challenges, uh, their medical problems. What are some of the challenges that rare diseases, you know, face in regards to research? I think that there are many. I think to start very simple, if there are lots and lots of people that have a disease, it's often a lot easier to get money for it. They're right there constantly talking to Children's Hospital Philadelphia, where they have the leukodystrophy center that most of us go to. So that, yeah. you know, they communicate up in the Northeast like so well with everybody and so fast that I'm just very, very thankful because so far we've been able to do all of our appointments virtually. <laughs> Welcome AGS allies and caregivers to the Rare Advocates Podcast, proudly brought to you by a Cardi Gutierrez Syndrome Advocate Association. I'm Betty, your host and mom of Noah who battles with Cardi Gutierrez. Special thank you to our sponsor, Biogen. Join us for insightful conversations and updates on a Cardi Gutierrez Syndrome and rare diseases. Don't miss out, so please go ahead and subscribe, share, and engage with us in social media. We're here to support you every step of the way. Let's make a difference together. Today, we have a truly inspiring guest joining us. From the heart of clinical research at one point at Boston Children's Hospital to the forefront of biotech innovation, our guest has navigated a path dedicated to unraveling the mysteries of pediatric rare diseases. So join me as we dive into their journey, discoveries, and beacon of hope that they bring to families and caregivers worldwide. And now I will bring over our guest. Her name is Cynthia. Hi, Cynthia. How are you doing? I am good. How are you? Wonderful. It's a, It's been a busy couple of weeks, but I'm so excited that we finally have you on their Rare Advocates podcast and to get to know you a little bit better. Yeah, same. I'm excited. <laughs> good, good, good. So with that said, Cynthia, so I want to start from the very beginning. Right now you work at Biogen and that's where we'll end. But let's take it back a couple of years and I want to, I want to learn how did you decide to become a geneticist? Yeah, that's how far do you want to go back? Because technically uh, being a geneticist is genetic for me because my father is a, a population geneticist. So not exactly the same type of genetics that I do, but uh, I did learn from a very young age about DNA and I was always fascinated. So uh, wow. yeah, it's an inborn. But the moment that I decided I wanted to go into rare disease genetics was in medical school when uh, they had a round of showing us different specialties and they would come to give a lecture and a, a, a clinical geneticist came and they brought a patient and they were showing like, this is what we do. And I was just fascinated from, from the very beginning. I thought it's, um, yeah, a very important job that you have because people want to know what is going on because how can you address what is happening to a child or an adult that has a genetic disorder if you don't know what is wrong uh, and I was fascinated by this idea of you know one small change in DNA and then recognizing a pattern of changes in patients and helping them find the best way to address everything that they have um, their challenges uh, their medical problems so yeah I think it was very early for me. <laughs> yeah. May I ask about how old were you when you were like, yes, I want to be like my my dad. You know, I know he's you mentioned he's a different type of geneticist, but that you knew you're like, this is so fascinating. Do you recall about how old you were? Yeah, um, I think when I was about 12, um, he took me to a course that he was teaching for dog owners about genetics. And I saw the back and I was like, wow, my dad does the coolest thing. This is so interesting. And that was just with, you know, funded squares and calculating mm. risks for dogs to have certain uh, a good or, or bad characteristics. Um, mm. Yeah, I remember sitting there and thinking, wow, this is really cool. Uh, but I also wanted to be a doctor, but I didn't know you could combine the two until that lecture that, yes. that they... That's so, that's so fascinating. And the reason I asked that is because 
um, with a lot of families, some of our kids um, that were born with a cardiotear syndrome were not necessarily the first kid, right? They were, like my case, the second kid. And so my son is, like many of the siblings, rare siblings out there, they're so compassionate and they're just so loving. Like, I honestly have never seen that kind of love before. And um, he's five. But he started asking a little bit more questions about the body and the anatomy and the physiology earlier because we had to explain certain things. And so that's what I was asking because my son is so fascinated. Like I'll ask him random questions like, how many lungs do we have? He's so excited. He's like, two. How many intestines do we have? Two. What is the difference between the two? But it just, it evolved that way. I never pushed him. It evolved that way because we wanted to explain a little bit about the type of pictures that Noah got and why he got pictures of his brain. And that kind of explains it a little bit, like the look at dystrophy side of things. So it wasn't because I wanted to push in, but it just happened. And yeah, so yeah. Um, I want to pick up on your story. You said, you know, it was during rounds in med school and it was a particular case more or less. So it, it was a series of lectures where they were introducing different specialties to, to the medical students. Um, yes, like the, the least um, known specialties, I guess. Mm-hmm. So be somebody from immunology and, you know, not the surgery or the more common specialties that everybody's seen on Grey's Anatomy, but, you know, <laughs> the obscure. I'm, I'm <laughs> Genetic like theory huge, in the big brand, like so. Huge. <laughs> Fan of Christ, I mean. but I now know because of Noah. Like I'm like, who? Oh, how come he can operate on kids and adults? That's not how it works. Chris Anatomy is not real life. No, it's not. <laughs> and uh, you know, I appreciate them that they're exposing some things, right? But it, yeah. Now, unfortunately, I know. Um, that not all doctors can all of a sudden be like, can I have a genome lab <laughs> and start becoming geneticists like Dr. Bailey? In Grey's Anatomy, Dr. Bailey is going to run to the patient and draw her own blood, then take that to the lab where she looks Look under at a microscope. it herself. Yes, she looks under a microscope and there she has a whole exome sequence, but that is not how it works. <laughs> so let's talk about, so you went to med school, you decided to pursue this, and so... Uh, explain to us a little bit of my, about um, genetics overall and more or less like your role of like diagnosing patients or when, you know, I know you're not doing that right now but, and we'll get to that later, but just a little bit more about geneticists in general. Yeah, so um, cl- I did clinical genetics residencies in the Netherlands um, and it's a little bit different there than here okay. uh, in the Netherlands. Clinical genetics is a is a separate specialty, like a pediatrician or something like that. In um, the U.S., clinical genetics is um, more of an add-on. Like you do pediatrics or internal medicine, and from there you super specialize in clinical genetics. So I did um, I did do some pediatrics residencies before because I thought it would be really uh, important to know more about the average kid before going into kids that have something special. Um, so clinical geneticists in the Netherlands see all kinds of patients. So you are trained to do both oncology, but also cardiogenetics. Uh, you can be in a uh, rare disease like I super specialized in. Um, so uh, you are trained as a full uh, breadth uh, clinical geneticist, whereas here you are more in a super specialty already because you did your first residency in a certain direction. Um, I guess if I should describe what somebody with my background would do on an average day okay. in clinic, um, you would see patients with, uh, in my case, usually kids with developmental delay. Um and do an intake and hear the story from the parents, look at the medical records that they bring and make a decision on, um, yeah, what kind of things could be happening to this child and what is diagnostics that I want to do to figure out exactly what is going on. Um, it's changed a lot. The last time that I worked in the clinic, whole exome sequencing wasn't uh, as common as it is now. 
Um, so you would have to make much more of a decision. Am I going to order this panel or that gene sequencing, or am I going to start with a chromosomal microarray, for example? Uh, nowadays, it's much easier to go to those um, heavy duty, I guess, uh, genomics testing, uh, where you get a lot of answers with one test. Um, and then once you order your testing, you have to wait a while for the test to come back. And then hopefully you will have answers for your patient, uh, which is where the interesting part begins, I think, because at that point you can start to talk to parents, okay, this is what's happening. And we think that this diagnosis is correct because we see this, this, and this in your child. And you have to explain to them, you know, this is the gene that is affected. These are things you might be expecting in the future because, you know, genes cause a pattern of effects. So you can make some predictions of what may turn up in the future. And I say may because genetics is interesting and everything is on a spectrum. Um, and then often you call in colleagues that will help with this patient because, you know, I am not a neurologist, so I am not going to be managing the seizures. I am not a dermatologist, so I'm not going to help with any skin problems that someone may have. So uh, we will involve other specialties to take care of the patient in the long term and make sure that they have the best care possible. Yes, you mentioned so many key things, so many key things. And I love how you also emphasize this the spectrum, right? Um, yeah. When you get the diagnosis and uh, it just kind of brings back memories because the first time, so Noah, I usually don't talk too much about him, but I think sometimes it's very important because um, I'm hopefully spreading awareness, um, but he suffered from a stroke. And so that's what triggered, you know, an MRI and just, you know, for to bring the neuro neurologist to our team. And that's who suggested, hey, let's go ahead and bring in the geneticist. And immediately I thought all the negative things and I almost forgot because I was living in this parallel world that genetics existed, even though I think it was like in my seventh grade, like chemistry class, like. A professor lectured it for like, you know, like a week or two and we did like blue eyes or green eyes. And so yeah. that brings me to, um, you know, my next question is a lot of us didn't know we were carriers and it seems like the odds were against us. We were like, you know, what are the odds that I found someone that was also a carrier and then we happened to pass, you know, this condition to our kid. So maybe you can expand a little bit on that because I want to go ahead and just, you know, remind our audience that, you know, there's a lot of things that we just don't know. So maybe from your point of view. Yeah. I think the one most important point to this that I would like to make is that you could not have known this. This is not something that you in any way could have predicted. You don't know that you are a carrier of a genetic disease until it shows up in your child. And it's, I feel a lot of parents have a lot of guilt, like, oh, I gave my DNA to my kid and now he's sick. But, but you couldn't have known that you were a carrier of a genetic disease. So I really hope that if anything, I have told every single parent that I've ever seen in the hospital, that this is not your fault in any way. Like you, you don't carry any guilt and you should never feel like that. Even though I think that a lot of parents do have this feeling on the inside, like, Oh, it's, it's because of me. Yeah. But you also, you know, everything is because of you because it's your child, but you couldn't have known that you were passing on a disease. You were also passing on your brown hair in your brown eyes or, you know, your funny looking, fourth finger or something like that you know <laughs> it's like all the family traits but unfortunately you didn't know that one of the family traits that was hidden in there was AGS yes it's it's definitely hard and then going back to what you also said earlier is like sometimes developmental delays are one of the first cues is that what you were saying could you expand on that a little bit more yeah a lot of diseases don't have a very specific pattern of things that that are shown in the children uh, i'm talking about children here all the time yeah. because that's the kind of genetics that i'm focused on but of course this is the same in an adult with with a genetic disorder but uh specifically in in children with genetic disorders 
often it's not very clear what's going on. Like, unless you have a seizure or something like this as your first symptom, then perhaps we just don't know if something is really happening. Unless somebody is very delayed, you may not notice in the beginning that something is going on. So it can be a while before something is triggered, and it can be a long while before somebody thinks, oh, maybe we should do genetics. Because um, I feel like often people try to still see it as a, as normal because you don't want to be too worried. But I often see parents that have taken quite a while going to the pediatrician and say, I feel like something is, is not right with my child, especially if it's your second child. But even when it's your first child, often the parents know. And yes, you can say, oh, that parent is, is worried and, and just... You know, put that aside and say, oh, no, this is all normal. But uh, yeah, I feel like that's a, what contributes to sometimes a very long diagnostic trajectory for yeah. patients. With because the first symptoms are often not that specific. And of course, if certain combinations of symptoms start to appear, people are more likely to start thinking, oh, perhaps we should have the geneticist look. Like you said, like it, it took quite a while mm-hmm. when the stroke that's not normal that a kid has a stroke but you know it takes the, the right kind of neurologist to trigger a cascade that genetics so maybe yeah we're still working on awareness as a specialty and it yeah. seems very easy to a lot of physicians too like oh no, i'll just order some genetic tests but that's not always <laughs> the way to to come to the right diagnosis if you just order a random genetic test. And, yes. Yeah. So that kind of takes me. So, you know, we're talking a, a little bit of clinical, which is something that you practice for a little bit. But then also something you have in your area is to research, right? And I think that's so key because I started count- encountering, and this happened also with a cardiotera syndrome, HES, that not all genes associated with this diagnosis were discovered immediately. And so that yeah. makes me think of research, the importance of research and publishing papers so that hopefully physicians read them and they're more aware of, you know, yeah. the the advances that medicine has made. So I would like to know your input from a research perspective too, because you started talking about it and that is, you know, you know, what are some of the challenges that rare diseases, you know, face in regards to research? Yeah, I think that there are many. Uh, <laughs> I think to start very simple, if there are lots and lots of people that have a disease, if there are a million people that have a disease, it's often a lot easier to get money for it because everybody knows somebody who has diabetes or had a heart attack or something like that. Um, Whereas these rare diseases, most people will never in their life meet somebody with AGS. It's so rare that there are only few kids that have it. Um, It makes it less aware in the public eye. And so it's it's harder to to find funding for, for this kind of research. Fortunately, there are many government grants and uh, many private foundations that um, yeah, step into this hole. And especially in the last perhaps 20 years, um, there's also a lot of parent foundations, as you know, uh, who are very active in getting funds and uh, getting this kind of research started. Um, and because some of these uh, diseases are a little bit more obscure, a little bit hidden from the public eye. There's also much less knowledge about the basics of the disease. Mm-hmm. So uh, sometimes those genes are, you know, there's a couple of papers in PubMed that you can find, but there's not as much known about the exact function of the gene. Um, so you will need to not only fund directly treatment, but you need to also uh, somehow find funding to look at the beginning of uh, the disease, like what exactly is happening? What does this change in the gene do? And why does a patient get this uh, disease? Um, So that that starts with what is the function of this gene exactly? Like, how can we figure out where where is it? In what tissue is it important? Does it work all your life? Do you just need it for the first three months of your life? Things like this. Um, And then I think 
another thing that is really important in rare disease is um, to find people that are interested. Like if you have big diseases, it's uh, easier to find somebody who will start the research. Mm -hmm. Rare disease, you might have to look around a little bit more. There may be one person in the world specialized in uh, (laughs) this disease. Nobody and, and maybe you have to start to create the awareness and, and find people that are going to be interested in it. And then if you look a little bit later, maybe you've made a perfect treatment, but then you want to do a trial. So, yeah, then suddenly you have to go and find that one in 100,000 or, or one in 200,000 people in the world that have this disease and somehow make them aware that there is a trial and that they could take part in it. Um yeah, so I think that there are a lot of challenges. Um, I'm, but- so, I'm so glad you're speaking of all of this because sometimes we have to say things out loud for other people to to realize that's like, one, my child is not necessarily going to get better because there's no treatment <laughs> or cure. And like you said that, you know, no one has stole it off for me, you know. There's a gene that's involved and, you know, it's it could affect short-term or long-term because we might need that gene, like a cardiovascular syndrome for the rest of our lives. And we forget that that instruction, and I don't know if that's the right term, instruction that we have, you know, we all have it and we just don't think about it, right? Like in our case, making myelin. And so it's just one of those things that, I don't want to say I took for granted, but to an extent I did. You know, I didn't realize because I'm not in the field that you are. Let me make some myelin because my brain needs it. Like nobody, you know, I always say to my patients, it's like you have a cookbook. Your DNA is like a cookbook and every recipe that you need, it's automatically sent to all the right positions if everything is going correctly. But if you have one spelling error in your recipe or in the instruction on how to get it in the right tissue, then suddenly it doesn't work like that anymore. And then you need, you know, doctors like me and and scientists who are going to somehow find a way to get the right recipe in the right place, hopefully make everything better. Yeah. We need you so, so much. We need, I could have said that when I got my diagnosis, a geneticist was not my favorite person because they delivered the news, but now it's one of the most important people, one of the most important doctors I've learned because they're not just dealing with the consequences. They're really trying to find like the root cause and really understand you know, how to make things better for the patient. So it's, it's a completely different mindset because I even told moms that approach is like, Hey, how did you come up with the diagnosis? I'm like, you have to start talking about if you, if you haven't, which sometimes, you know, a doctor will briefly mention it and say, we're not there yet, you know, because I understand, but I'm like, it's okay to advocate if you have a gut, a gut feeling and be like, can when when will that conversation take place what needs to happen and then um you know come up with a plan that you feel comfortable with so that way you know what the next steps are and speaking of okay so let's say that someone you know advocates for it and um uh, and it comes back as undiagnosed and so this kind of goes back to research as well it's like i know that medicine is at advancing and so not because the gene is not there it doesn't mean not that they not because the undiagnosed not because the and you can help me reword this not because the gene was not identified doesn't mean it's not associated with a syndrome or disease right yeah i always feel like i joined genetics at the at the perfect time because when i started in the clinic uh, you literally had to order every test one by one. So you had to make a decision and think, okay, this patient has this combination of symptoms, it has these special features in their face and has, you know, we were looking at hands and fingers and toes to have clues of, of where to look. And then you would basically just go and look in your book and on the internet and think, okay, I'm going to order these tests for this patient. Um, then a little bit later in my career, they bundled uh, a bunch of genes and you could just say, okay, I think that this is AGS. So I'm going to order an AGS panel rather than ordering first the most prevalent AGS gene and go step by step. 
Uh, and now genetics has changed completely again because we have whole exome sequencing. So you look at all the genes at the same time. So maybe if you thought the patient has AGS, but they have something that looks like it, you will still get your result if you did whole exome sequencing. Um, and then, of course, we have the next step that is whole genome sequencing because the exome only looks at the coding regions. But there are lots of things that go wrong in the regions in between the coding regions. So um, looking at the genome means you look at all the DNA. We are getting better and better at uh, identifying causes of things that can go wrong in those regions. But we're still not there yet. We still can't interpret every little bit of DNA yet. And there are still things that we can't find. Um, I think for most genes at this point, we have a really good idea of who they are, where they are important. Um, but it's a step-by-step -step process. And I regularly look at DNA results and have to say, I'm sorry, we don't quite know yet if this is the cause or we'll just need more research. We'll need to do additional testing or we just need to wait until science gets smarter. Yeah. yeah. And I brought this up because we had some late diagnosed patients, but it wasn't because it wasn't because, um, because they were, you know, because it was specifically because that gene was not associated with a cardio tears syndrome yet. You know, in 2020, I think it was the last time they yeah. added more genes. And so, and then we still have a group of individuals in our community that are suspected of a cardio tear syndrome, but nothing has come up yet, right? Yeah. So we do have that and we include them in... I mean, everything makes sense for them to be a cardio tear syndrome, yeah. but not everyone has those clues, such as the gene associated or like the features, you know, because yeah. our geneticist for, for no, immediately looked at them and it just kind of brings some sort of like weird feeling in my stomach. But, um, just by our like two hour meeting, she, um, she made an educated, um, call that it was possibly a cardio tear syndrome. So she took the features and she was so polite. And if I, if I would see her again, I would hug her because she actually moved to a different city because I didn't realize how much kind how much knowledge she was bringing. And it was just such a scary time for, for us. And it's, it's course, hard to it's, explain. I always say as a geneticist, you don't see any of your patients because they're doing so great. And that makes your so hard you often see people at the very worst moment of their life uh, i was involved in a big study where we were uh, doing whole exome sequencing before it was common to do this um with a rapid turnaround time so a seven day answer for babies in the NICU and it was a really good study we were quite successful in finding the diagnosis but it was really hard because you see every single parent right after birth um right after things have come up with that brand new baby and that nobody expected to happen, of course. Um, and none of the patients that you see are in the NICU because they're doing fantastic, of course. They have seizures or they have metabolic problems. or um, And that makes your, your job as a geneticist hard, but also super important. And I think, um, yeah, it takes a special person to be in genetics yeah. because you have to explain very difficult things at a very difficult time in someone's life and hopefully help them make things a little bit better. I couldn't um, agree more. I couldn't agree more. Mm. I have not met one single mean geneticist. <laughs> oh, and I met, I met a, because now, you know, I'm an advocate and now, you know, I'm just like, I, I actually like been talking to different hospitals just because of how complex NUA is and also because of my other part-time job. So I've met um, more than I could want. So at least 10 of them. That's a lot, I think. Like, no one should have to meet that much. But everyone... I oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's different. <laughs> Besides Dr. Bailey. <laughs> I haven't have officially met her. But, you know, it's just everyone <laughs> is so... You have met her? No, no. She's not a genetic Dr. Oh, Bailey. Yeah. Right. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> But yes, so I am, I'm just so, so thankful for the work and you as a clinic, cl clinician, he started as that and then, um, research. And that was also your last position was the Boston children's hospital. Yeah. Um, 
do you want me to say how I, I yes yes I want to hear about your your experience because um after that I want to hear about the transition you know because we're going to jump into the next big part which is now you're part of Biogen but tell me about Boston yeah Boston Children's was an amazing place originally um my very first encounter there was during my PhD okay. um, I had a, a collaboration and I just visited for a couple months and it was amazing. I learned so many things and I saw so many patients. So I did always want to come back. And then um, a couple of years later, my partner at the time got a scholarship to study at the Harvard Kennedy School. And I decided to take a break in my career and join him. And I thought I was going to sit at home and read a lot of books and knit scarves. And after a week, I thought, oh, I need something for my brain. <laughs> So I just contacted the lab where I had previously been and they said, sure, um, come and see. And I wrote a grant and got accepted and then decided to stay for a couple more months. And those couple of months turned into 11 years that I'm in the U.S. now. So <laughs> yeah, I just always stayed because it was really interesting. I feel like Boston Children's is a really special place because it's probably the best children's hospital in the world. And I don't say that to make oh. anybody else mad, but I feel like it's definitely in the in the top children's hospitals in the world they have so much expertise they have um all of that together and they have good funding they have really good opportunities they're right in in boston where they can connect with um other great hospitals other great research institutions but yeah. also with so much biotech so i've seen amazing collaborations evolve um just because you asked a question about a patient, suddenly someone from a biotech company joined and helped you think through a project or something like that. Um, so I feel like it was, it's a really special place to to be. Uh, and it will always have a good part of my heart. <laughs> I feel like um, it was a time for me to, to move on, but it was, uh, yeah. And there's a lot of second and, and third opinion patients that come there for highly specialized treatment or follow and follow up that's that's my story i went and got a second opinion at boston children's hospital yeah. so i'm located in texas and i'm very transparent about that because every state is different you know every state has different resources and uh, not all doctors want to live in texas and so we're fine with that but i knew we had a rare case and so we seeked out for help in the northeast and then as well in california and we met with uh, Dr. Edward Smith. He's a neurologist, a neurosurgeon at Boston. And he looked at Noah's MRIs as a second opinion. And he very kindly told us, hey, let's wait for the genetic results. Like he knew, he knew, you know, in his, yeah. with all his knowledge and gut feeling that we were going to receive bigger news. And right now, dealing with a stroke was not like immediate. Yeah. Um, he actually leads the center of Moya, pediatric Moya Moya because yeah. that's what caused Noah's um, stroke. Um, and that's associated, all those symptoms are associated with specifically the CMDH1 in a cardioterra syndrome. And so type 5. And so we seek that for a second opinion. And he's, you know, he's still part of our team. And um they were so kind. So Boston has a special place in my heart because during those really hard times, they were just so understanding and they talk constantly, something you talked about. You know, they're they're right there constantly talking to Children's Hospital Philadelphia where they have the leukodystrophy center that most of us go to. So, that yeah. you know, they communicate up in the Northeast like so well with everybody and so fast that I'm just very, very thankful because so far we've been able to do all of our appointments virtually and not have to go to, from Philadelphia to Boston and then back to Texas. So yeah, yeah. I'm thankful for for those systems that they have in place in, in the Northeast um, hospitals. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, um, yeah, that is just something amazing that in for these rare disease patients you don't have as much of a competitive space i feel like no. so I'm, oh yeah i don't know how to phrase that in a in a nice way but in some cases there can be a lot of competition which doesn't always make things better because you know you have two people hunting after the same mechanism or 
And I feel like for rare disease, um, that just doesn't exist as much. And everybody recognizes, oh, this is the specialist um, mm -hmm. that we're asked to weigh in on this case. And I think that that is, yeah, a, a much better way to take care of your patients and give them the best care that you can. Yeah. It has their limitations and it's great to, yeah. 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 So let's talk about the, the next step in your career. So you mentioned, was it at while at Boston that you yeah. made, go ahead. Um, well, it was actually, yeah, a bit serendipitous. I was talking about this study in the NICU that we did where we was, were trying to be better at diagnosing patients. And um, we were quite good at diagnosing the patients. But then when I went back to see how everybody was doing after six months and after 12 months, it turned out that of the patients that I enrolled, almost all of them had either passed away or had very serious problems. And at that point, I was thinking, now we are so good in seven days, we can know what you have and we still cannot do anything for you. We cannot, we can treat the symptoms, but we cannot actually make you better. Like we can try to give you uh, some medication to, to stop the seizures. And in so many cases, even though we know what is going on, we couldn't actually make life better for those patients. So I was feeling a little bit down and thinking, yeah, here I am and I did all this studying <laughs> for many years and all these you know residencies and I still don't know how to make my patients better and at that exact time I got an email from Biogen and I had spoken to somebody uh, there before like really informally uh, in a conference um, and they basically said oh we are looking for geneticists to to come work on our rare diseases and it was basically exactly those kids at a children's hospital i could diagnose but not help suddenly i got the opportunity to work on a treatment and of course it's a big step because i'm no longer seeing any patients i'm no longer taking care of a family or it's a very big step um but i do feel like it's a very good step i feel like i'm doing really useful things i'm actually helping rare disease patients um as a group no longer the individual but yeah so i feel like for me it was a good decision um i'm not saying i will never go back to being a clinician <laughs> i feel like maybe at some point i will miss it too much but um yeah i feel for now especially in this time and place where so many genetic therapies are the main focus I think that this is a really good place for me to be, to use my expertise to help streamline these procedures, um, to help think through what are good indications for the future that we could start to work on. Um, yeah, to stay updated on what is new and, and what can we think of uh, for the future. Yes. Yeah. So okay. I like that you said what is new, because that brings up to my next question, innovation. Let's talk a little bit about yeah. innovation because I think right now the big buzz that um, us parents of rare disease that it's really hard to not pay attention to is when we hear gene therapy uh, or just anything innovating, you know, that revolves yeah. that has the word gene, right? And yeah. so I would like to know, you know, what innovations in like rare disease treatment do you are they? close to us or you know they're exciting or what what can you share with us i think that's a very hard question because that's good to know I, uh, i'm not the average person when it comes to genetics so it's a little bit difficult for me to know like how well do you know about certain things so of course there has been a big rush of asos uh, antisense oligonucleotides, which is a, a way to treat genetic disease or certain types of genetic disease. Uh, gene therapy has improved so much over the last 20 years or so. Um, so suddenly gene therapy is a much more uh, viable option for many diseases as well, because the risks have lowered compared to the benefits that they bring. Um, there are a lot of new therapies in development. Everybody's, of course, heard of the CRISPR twins that uh, happened a couple of years back in China. Um, that technique has a lot of potential for rare disease. 
um, but we are very much not there yet. Okay. This is good to uh, hear. We need to know what's going on to understand. Yeah. I think that there are so many innovative new um, um, things that are knocking on the door, but it's a little bit hard to predict what exactly is going to be. Like if you think of AGS, um, yeah, of course, there are some companies working on it, including Biogen. Um, but what is going to be the best solution there? You can't automatically make one gene therapy for everybody, for example, because AGS has a complex background with multiple genes involved. Um, but, you know, so there are different ways that you could approach diseases. So I think that every disease is going to have a slightly different answer. Um, you know, certain metabolic disorders, enzyme replacement has worked very well. Um, yeah. No. If I, don't I... Is... <laughs> Go ahead. I don't know if this is a, a, a yeah, a, a satisfying answer. It's it's difficult it to is. answer that. <laughs> it is because sometimes the news make it seem closer than it really is. So sometimes, yeah. you know, it's it's not a bad thing to be optimistic. It's there's nothing wrong with being that. I think we continue to make advancements in medicine every single day. We're thankful for clinicians, researchers, and also like yourself, part of, you know, the biotech industry. And so to me, one step closer is for better than we were yesterday, right? And I just learned to ground myself a little bit. And yeah. I think, you know, we're we're all working towards the same goal. And I think it's important for families when they can't contribute to research, you know, and families contribute to, you know, surveys and just, you know, in any way they can, because like you said, we at the beginning of the podcast, it's like, you know, we need, we need sometimes like those families to step forward, right? So that we can like do the trials and figure out symptoms well, and so forth. Yeah. I mean, something to keep in mind when you're thinking about how news is reporting uh, is that every time it rains, news is going to say, there's a storm coming. So you should see it in that same light. Like not every rain is the dramatic storm that's going to take out your power and throw a tree on your car. Um, and they always make it sound worse or better. <laughs> um, so every time you hear something on the news where they're like, oh, we found the cure for cancer, yeah. take it with a grain of salt and calm down. Yeah. It's probably a little bit more nuanced than, than what they're saying on the news. But at the same time, like you said, it's important to stay optimistic and to see every opportunity and to not um, assume that boundaries are always going to be there. If I see how much has changed over my career, I could have never guessed that we would have been here. Uh, when I when I went to medical school, I don't even want to say how many years ago, <laughs> um, there were barely any opportunities to, to uh, treat genetic disease. It was symptoms only. Yeah. And now we have so many more tools in our toolbox. And that has been an innovation that has, yeah, really exploded over the last couple of years and i think that that is amazing um and i also think sometimes it's good to start tearing those barriers down yourself like uh, i've seen parents do the most amazing things to to push re research forward for the disease that their child has and i think that um yeah you have so much power as a family um, to create awareness, to talk to research, to make researchers and make connections, um, and to think in, yeah, not exactly the same old, same old ways, but to create new paths that maybe we as physicians or as researchers are not thinking of. So I think that, yeah, I've, I've seen parents do amazing things, like funding their own research line or, yeah, it's amazing. So... Yeah. Thank you so much. I think those are all amazing messages for families that are listening to the podcast or caregivers or even family members that not necessarily, you know, are the direct parents, but, you know, like grandparents and aunts or uncles listening to all of this is just puts things into perspective of what things families live every single day. So um, just to kind of start wrapping the, the podcast a little bit, 
any other messages that you may have out there for either the family or caregivers or maybe someone who's considering um, studying genetics? <laughs> well, yeah. different messages for everybody. I think for families, I think what I've seen with my patients is that it is so important to connect and to find other families with children that have the same disease. And I think it makes a, a, a giant difference if you... Uh, have another parent and you can just exchange your thoughts about what is happening and and perhaps you found a new um drug that that helps your child sleep better at night or that changes something about their skin features or you know so i think it's very important to find community and i think that that community can also be very helpful if you're thinking about looking towards therapies because once a community exists it's going to be so much easier to pull people in if you are for example biogen and you're looking for patients for your clinical trials or if you are a researcher at uh, boston children's hospital and you want to do mris of a patient group to push knowledge further so i think that it's important to connect and to make as many connections as you can and to stay in the loop I think if somebody wants to study genetics today, I would say, well, welcome. You have come to the most interesting uh, field of medicine that you could find because genetics has something to do with everything. So you will need to know everything, but don't be worried. You will get there step by step. And um, I think you will have an amazing career because if I see what has changed over the years that I've been here, I think that you will see so much more in the next couple of years. And I think, yeah, this is the best place where you can be if you want to be a geneticist. Yeah, I encourage it. Cynthia, I absolutely loved our conversation because it's, it's just so wonderful to hear things from your point of view and how far we have come and your kindness to rare disease families. I think on behalf of the community, like, I wish I could just hug a biogen because since I started like talking to you guys, it's just, it's nothing by warm and we need warmness and we just need, you know, we need that, that fuel, which is hope and be optimistic and Hey, everyone puts their grain salt, grain of salt. And, you know, I, my son participates in different research and not every family is going to participate to the same level, but Hey, if you can do just one little thing, that's plenty, that's plenty. And if you can't, it's okay it's totally okay. Like it's just so tough out there. Yeah. I mean, every little thing helps if you're trying to further knowledge, even if you just send the slides of an MRI to uh, somebody who collects that information or yeah. So I think parents are doing an amazing job and you already have such a giant job. Uh, just taking care of a child in general is a lot of work. Um, but if you have a child that has extra needs, then, um, it's an extra big job and you become one of the experts on that disease. Um, so I think that, you know, you're doing an amazing job. I think that that's really important. Well, thank you so much for joining our podcast. I really appreciate you so very much. And we enjoyed having you here today. Yeah, I enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for having me.